सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली डू यू रिमेम्बर फॉर्मर इंडियन एम्बेसडर टू यू एस रॉन एन सेंस कंट्रोवर्शियल हेडलेस चिकन रिमार्क वे बैक इन टू थाउजेंड सेवन he was referring to the mps who were opposing the indo us uh, civil nuclear deal then of course he had to apologize as our parliamentarians were outraged you must be wondering why i am talking about it 15 years later well that's because i was suddenly reminded of that headless chicken's remark when i was thinking about our opposition parties on the weekend i know it sounds a bit harsh but i have reasons for this I and mean, this is what i'm going to discuss in this episode of politically correct i'm going to explain why why i'm thinking about that 2007 remark you know on friday congress leaders especially gandhi siblings were all over tv screens they were agitating against price rise unemployment and gst on essential items towards the evening a video blogger posted an interesting meme it showed at an aam aadmi being beaten by another person who was wearing a saffron scarf i mean supposedly the government when a third person again supposedly the opposition intervened the man who was getting thrashed i mean the aam aadmi he pushed that opposition person away saying it's my government beating me who are you get out of here and then came a tv reporter and then he started he started saying as you can see people are suffering atrocities but the opposition party is a mute spectator not fulfilling its responsibility i'll just take a pause to let you watch this meme for yourself vipaksh mukh darshak bana hua hai aap is zimmedari ko nahi nibha raha hai ji ha aap tasveeron mein dekh rahe hain kyon maar rahe ho bhai kya baat hai kyon maar oh hello aap ko ek baar bola hua samajh nahi aata meri sarkar मुझे मारे या कुछ करे आपको क्या चले यहां से आप शुरू करो वेल आई डोंट नो हाउ मच यू लाइक इट बट विदाउट मेकिंग एनी वैल्यू जजमेंट अबाउट द कंटेंट्स आई कैन जस्ट टेल यू आई लव इट इट्स हिलेरियस आई एम श्योर कांग्रेस लीडर्स टू मस्ट हैव लव इट बिकॉज फॉर वन इट शोज द मीडिया टारगेटिंग द अपोजिशन फॉर द गवर्नमेंट्स मिस्टेक्स मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली it's a veiled rebuke to the janata the aam aadmi for being in love with the narendra modi government even when they are suffering that's exactly what one hears from opposition leaders in their private conversations you know basically you deserve to suffer because you keep voting for modi and you can feel that acute sense of resignation and desperation in them they don't seem to know how and when they can return to power I mean, even Mamata Banerjee, I mean, who should be more confident after defeating the BJP on her home turf last year, has her best hope in Modi's party not getting a full majority in 2024. You must have uh, heard her statement, and you can understand the reason for this desperation. There was a time when a steep rise in the price of even one single commodity, uh, onion, would bring down governments. Prices of several essential items have hit the roof now. but there are no spontaneous demonstrations or agitations anywhere in the country and priyanka wadra might have jumped over a barricade sat on the road been dragged into a police van and rahul gandhi might have been detained in a police station but there was no aam aadmi coming out on the roads to show solidarity so what does the opposition do if the people remain unimpressed even when they take up their causes the other day a congress mp was telling me you know you people keep saying the opposition has no narrative we can only expose the government's failures but you call it negative politics modi did exactly that in 2014 and that's what he's told me so when i told him that modi also had a positive campaign about you know gujarat model of governance the mp said you know you can say he had gujarat model of governance to sell but rahul gandhi cannot sell the upa model that was rejected by voters it's easier to say opposition has no narrative he was actually peeved 
So this parliamentarian and his colleagues in the opposition, I think they are not getting the point. And this is the crux of what I'm going to discuss today. The opposition parties are telling the people why they should vote out the Modi government. I'm not saying that everything they say against the Modi government is wrong. And they have many valid arguments. What I'm driving at here is why I think these arguments are cutting no ice. The reason is that the opposition parties uh, want voters to reject Modi, but they are not telling them why they should reject Modi and instead elect Rahul Gandhi or Mamata Banerjee or Arvind Kejriwal and there are lots of them of course. To explain my point, uh, let us look at the opposition's line of attack. For the sake of convenience, I have made five broad categories of allegations that the opposition parties have been making against the Modi government. I will deal with each of them in very brief and try to explain why they are not sticking to Modi. Not because all allegations are unfounded or entirely untrue, but because those who are making the allegations somehow lack credibility in the eyes of the Janta. Let's start with the first allegation, that is Modi government's failure to manage the economy. I'm not a domain expert here, and so I won't make any value judgment here. All I can say here is that COVID-19 has given the government a good excuse to erase any questions about the past. As our editor in chief Shekhar Gupta uh, had pointed out, I think last year in one of his uh, national interest columns, you know, the economy had started stalling right after demonetization and growth was declining for several quarters before the pandemic struck. But of course, no one remembers it now. COVID-19 had, has erased those memories and the government maintains that, you know, everything that is happening today is because of the pandemic. Anyway, I'm not qualified to talk about the economy. I go by what economists have been saying and writing of late. You know, pro and anti-establishment experts have their convenient facts and figures, just enough to confuse the Aam Admi like me. So we don't know. So straight away, I'll come to the political part of it. Suppose the people are actually in economic distress. Who would they trust more? Modi or Rahul Gandhi or Mamata Banerjee or Arvind Kejriwal or even KCR? Let me return to the Congress party's agitation over price rise and unemployment. Well, as I said, gone are the days when onion prices brought down governments. So there was this post-poll survey conducted by uh, this uh, think tank CSDS uh, Lokaniti for the Hindu uh, during the 2022 assembly elections. And those surveys suggested that price rise and unemployment did concern the people. In Uttar Pradesh, for instance, 74% people said that inflation was very important for them. Then 71% respondents said that unemployment was very important for them. But when it came to voting, these concerns did not really swing their decision. And so 38% respondents listed development as the single most important factor or voting issue for them, compared to 7% who said that unemployment actually dictated their voting behavior. And only 6% of them said that it was inflation that actually dictated their voting behavior. Again, come to Uttarakhand. About four-fifths of the respondents said that unemployment and inflation had increased in the last five years of the then BJP government. In fact, I had gone to Mukteshwar uh, ahead of uh, elections and I had met a lot of people who were complaining about petrol and LPG prices as also the price of oil and other essential commodities. Well, as we know, uh, it obviously did not matter much when they came, went out to vote. The people gave a renewed mandate to the BJP in Uttarakhand too. Now, my interpretation is that even if the people were unhappy with the BJP governments in those states, they probably reposed more faith in Modi and his CM nominees because opposition leaders did not inspire much confidence in voters. Anyway, let's come to the second major charge of the opposition against the Modi government. That is, that Modi or we call the BJP or RSS, I mean, they are communal, they play communal Hindu majoritarian, majoritarian politics. They are killing India's pluralistic ethos. I mean, these are the allegations coming from the opposition camp. Well, one can deny the fact about them uh, playing majoritarian, majoritarian politics. But the question is, how are opposition leaders countering it? Let me give you some examples of how they are countering it. So Rahul Gandhi becomes a Janodhari Brahmin, Dattatri Brahmin, what Sujewala had said then. 
Mamta Banerjee starts reciting Chandipat and he starts giving stipends to uh, Purohits. Arvind Kejriwal performs Diwali Puja at a replica of the Ayodhya temple in Delhi and ensures that it's telecast live, all with, all with the tax, taxpayers' money, of course. Because the BJP is playing majority in politics, these opposition leaders went silent when shots were fired at Asaduddin Owaisi's vehicle in the run-up to the UP elections. You know all about it. No words of condemnation from them. Then, you know, the first and last time Rahul Gandhi hosted an iftar party, that was in 2018. And the last time he went to Ayodhya was in 2016. Then let me give you another example. So, Dakshin Kannada district in Karnataka, as you know, I mean, it's witnessing a spot in communal violence with the Hindu and two Muslims losing lives, losing their lives in what's seen by the police as communal and retaliatory killings. Rahul Gandhi visited Karnataka last week, but stayed away from Dakshin Kannada, choosing to deliver homilies elsewhere about the need for peace and harmony. Those killings, I mean, they never figured in his speech anywhere. I mean, directly. So these are some of the instances of how opposition leaders are trying to counter what they say is majoritarian politics of the BJP. So the so-called torch bearers of secularism in India, the Gandhis, the Mamtas, the KCRs, I mean, they seem to be seem to be so confused and hypocritical. I have just given you those instances. They wouldn't visit, visit the under construction Ram Temple in Ayodhya. Nor would they visit the mosque under construction in Dhanipur. That's just about 30-35 kilometers from the temple. Call it opposition leaders, what I say, neo-secularism. But unfortunately, that is appealing to, unfortunately for them, that is appealing to neither the Hindus nor the Muslims. The third charge of opposition leaders is that the RSS BJP is playing havoc with institutions. From the election commission to the judiciary to educational and cultural institutions, the central investigation agencies. What Rahul Gandhi says is that you know uh, this government, this party has captured all these institutions. And some of that is for all to see. The problem is that the opposition's charges resonate only with a select group of what you may call left liberal intelligentsia at best. For ordinary voters. I mean, you know, capturing institutions, institutional weaknesses, I mean, these are too complex and too distant from their daily lives to connect with. How did it matter to them if a former associate of, a, say, a TDP leader or a former legal counsel of a powerful BJP minister here or a man with an RSS background becomes a judge in, in, the, in higher judiciary? And what do these ordinary voters Make up opposition leaders going to town about ED, CBI, IT raids, and alleging political vendetta. Yes, their, their charges are very much valid. These agencies are being used to target the opposition for sure. We have been seeing that. But I am talking about public perception. So, what must ordinary voters think when they see bundles of, you know, 2000 rupee notes recovered from former? Bengal uh, Minister Partha Chatterjee's associates and when they see it on TV, TV screens, what do you think they will be thinking? I mean, Arvind Kejriwal says the BJP could use the agencies, the central agencies to frame his deputy, Manish Sisodia, in a fake case. A few days later, Sisodia demands a CBI inquiry against a former lieutenant governor. I mean, how come Kejriwal's deputy suddenly develops so much trust in the CBI? The Ahmadi must be very, I mean, totally confused. Opposition's fourth charge against the Modi government, government is that it distributes poor people's money among the rich. You must have heard them talking about, you know, Adanis, Ambanis. I mean, they keep taking all the names. But well, people getting free ration and money in their accounts under different schemes don't really seem to be bothered about these allegations. I mean, going by how they, how they have been voting in elections. So I won't talk much about this. The fifth charge is that the Modi government has compromised national security. For the opposition leaders who keep talking about how surgical strikes and the Balakote strike helped Modi's party in elections, I mean, targeting him over national security is, I think, a tad ambitious. 
even if the Modi government is on the back foot over the Chinese army's transgressions into Indian territory in Ladakh, it hasn't dented his image actually. We know, you know, I mean, there are surveys all around. Talk about the Chinese intrusions in villages. I mean, we keep traveling to talk to the villagers and they tell you how Modi has made China cringe with fear. I'm talking about public perception. Then they see, you know, while that is happening in villages in terms of public perception, I mean, you see Rahul Gandhi endorsing a book that says China can defeat India in 10 days if there is a war in near future. The book is going to be released shortly, but we are just looking at, uh, we just got a copy in advance, we are going through it. Right on top on the cover page, you have this blurb by Rahul Gandhi. How good is that book? How good that book is? And I don't know whether he saw the contents also. I mean, how many Indians would want to vote for an opposition leader with such an opinion about India's military might? It's not about the facts. It's not about how good or how bad or how big we are. It's about public perception. An opposition leader, if it is debunking its own military, basically saying that, you know, if there is a war, China will defeat us in 10 days, going by the author, well, how can he endorse it so publicly? Anyway, in a nutshell, the opposition parties, you know, they need political imagination to counter the Modi government. Their attempt to shorten Modi's line by cutting it, is not, it isn't really working. And they have not shown the willingness or capability to draw a bigger line. They don't seem to know what may work against Modi and what may not. So they keep raising one issue a day and forgetting the, them the very next day. I mean, I start recalling from demonetization to electoral bonds, Pegasus, Chinese intrusions, Agnipath, corruption charges against uh, Smriti Irani, price rise and so on and so forth. I mean, they keep hopping from one issue to another so much that forget about the people. They themselves may not remember what they were agitating against last week or last month. It was in this context that I suddenly remembered Ronan Sen's headless chicken's remark. That's all from me in this episode of Politically Correct. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.